Okay, this is um, the next chapter on the digestive system. Diarrhea is another manifestation, excessive frequency of stools, usually loose or watery in consistency. Steatorrhea refers to fatty diarrhea. These are greasy, loose stools, often with a foul odor. Um, they're a characteristic of malabsorption syndrome, celiac disease, or cystic fibrosis. Constipation. Uh, caused by lack of fiber or inadequate fluid intake, not responding to the defecation reflex, could be caused by muscle weakness and inactivity, uh, multiple sclerosis or spinal cord trauma. And sometimes medications will cause it too. Certain drugs, opiates, codeine, some antacids, iron supplements, and bulk lap laxatives are also quite frequently uh, things that might cause a problem. Basic diagnostic tests, radiographs are used with contrast medium, uh, barium, in oral solution or enema, and this makes the GI system structures visible. Um, ultrasound can detect unusual masses, CT, computed tomographic scans, and MRIs are used to detect liver and pancreatic abnormalities. Radioactive elements may be used uh, to make tracer studies. Fiber optic endoscopy um, helps with visualizing um, or biopsy of various segments of the GI tract. And sigmoidal or colonoscopy are routine screening tests. These are preventative and monitoring tools for cancer. There are also lab tests that are done. You can do an occult blood. Uh, you can do a lab analysis of um, stool specimens. Blood tests can check for liver and pancreatic function as well as monitor tumor markers like um, CEA, CEA, which is carcinoembryonic antigen. That's a marker for colon cancer. Just some other tests there I wanted to mention. Um, common therapies, dietary modification. Now this is helpful in treatment of many GI disorders, for example, Maybe a gluten-free diet for people with celiac disease, for an example. 
uh, stress reduction for people with peptic ulcer or chronic inflammatory bowel disorder when reoccurrences have been shown to be stress related and just something to keep in mind that stress has a profound effect on the GI tract as it does with many other systems but very very much so in showing or manifestations in the GI tract. Um, and stress, one of the things about stress, it stimulates the central nervous system and the sympathetic part of the autonomic service, uh, central nervous system. And this is autonomic, remember, which causes vasoconstriction and ischemia of the mucosa, which can lead to subsequent inflammation and ulceration. Also, um, if you suppress the parasympathetic response, then this leads to decreased peristalsis, which leads to irritation of the intestinal mucosa because substances aren't moving through smoothly like they should. And then the increased stress response increases glucocorticoids, which has a catabolic effect on the GI tract and its lining over the long term. Um, so those are just some things to think about related to stress, and we have talked about this in AMP, but I just want to bring it to mind. Drugs for treatment of GI disorders. There are antacids that reduce hyperacidity, like Malox and uh, Malox and Gelosil, um, antiemetics to relieve vomiting, Dramamine, gravel, compassine, uh, laxatives like Metamucil. Colase, um, anti-diarrheals like Imodium, antibacterial Zithromax and Prilosec, and histamine antagonist, Tagamet or Zantac, and there are others. These are just a few. There are also proton pump inhibitors to prevent acid formation, so Prevacid, Prilosec is a newer group of drugs that reduces gastric secretions by interfering with the exchange of H, uh, H ions and potassium in the stomach. Now let's look at different parts of the tract and the disorders starting with the mouth. Um, disorders of the oral cavity. Let's start with congenital defects like cleft lip and cleft palate. Now cleft lip is where the maxillary processes do not fuse and cleft palate is the failure of the hard and soft palates to fuse. There are also inflammatory lesions, aphthous ulcers, canker sores, also a common problem caused by, usually caused by strep sanguis. Um, infections opportunistic infections from the normal flora like um, candidiasis, thrush. Um, sometimes people that wear their dentures overnight can make a nice environment for a thrush to persist and certain antibiotics that will suppress normal flora in the mouth can cause thrush to erupt. So you treat with nystatin and then there's herpes simplex type 1 infection, which is uh, the eruption of cold sores and fever blisters, and you can treat this with acyclovir. This is looking at cleft lip and cleft palate. A lot of these are treated very early in development. And this is chronic uh, candidiasis from wearing dentures overnight. You see a lot of irritation there in the mouth. And then we have dental caries or cavities, an infection involving strep mutans and lactobacillus. Fluoride helps because it inhibits the ability of substances to bind to the enamel. Um, and it also enhances the remineralization process. And then we have something called periodontal disease. There are actually eight categories of this disease, ranging from mild gingival disease to severe periodontitis. And it's commonly caused by poor hygiene. 
but some systemic diseases and medications can cause it also. If gram-negative bacteria is involved, this can make it very serious. And the problem with periodontal disease is the wearing away of the periodontal ligament that holds the teeth in place, so teeth become very loose and they can fall out. So here's looking at uh, dental problems. The first picture shows you a healthy uh, periodontium, and then you have the effects of toothbrush trauma. And then C shows you calculus building up on teeth, and probably this person here is not using proper technique for brushing or flossing. D shows you the effect of smoking, and many times you don't see this on the anterior surface of the mouth. This is all behind, so you can see how blackened the teeth are. And then you can see the effects of severe periodontal disease, the wearing away of the gums that help to support the teeth, and uh, teeth will eventually uh, fall out. Okay, so let's talk about um, hyper keratosis and this is an overgrowth of the common uh, of the corneum of the epithelium inside the mouth it's also called leukoplakia which appears like a whitening of the tissue in the mouth which can lead to cancer and commonly found in the floor of the mouth under the tongue and most of your uh, dental practitioners now will look below the tongue and look for areas of leukoplakia when they're checking your mouth Usually this problem is caused by smoking, or it could be also a um, history of alcohol abuse, which can lead to the problem. Tumors inside the oral cavity have a very poor prognosis as they tend to be hidden. And these can go into something that you've probably heard of, squamous cell carcinoma, which is a common cancer of the oral cavity. So floor of the mouth, lateral borders of the tongue, Lip cancer a little bit easier to treat because it's obvious and accessible and has a and has a good prognosis because of that. Very common in pipe smokers. Let's look at salivary gland disorders now. Sialadenitis, inflammation of the salivary glands, very common in the parotid gland. Remember the parotid gland lies above um, the mastoid muscle in the uh, cheek of the mouth so it's outside of that particular muscle and it's usually caused by a mixovirus um, dysphagia that term means difficulty in swallowing so some of the causes here uh, fibrosis and this is with inflammation or ulceration, stenosis or a narrowing of the esophagus can result from fibrosis. Tumors, it could be perhaps in a mediastinal lymph node can compress the esophagus from the outside. Uh, diverticulum, outpocketings of the esophageal wall that these can result from congenital defects or from inflammation. They could form ulcers in the esophageal wall and bleed. Congenital attrition. This is a separation of the esophagus where you have, usually it's a developmental defect in which the upper and lower esophageal segments are separated. Um, the upper section ends in a blind pouch and needs to be surgically corrected as soon as possible. It's noted when formula or milk doesn't stay down, the baby keeps throwing up. Um, congenital tracheoesophageal fistula. These words get longer and longer, don't they? Congenital atricia with a connecting fistula from one segment to the trachea. And I'll show you pictures of these in just a minute. Um, neurological damage to certain cranial nerves that innervate um, the esophagus and the upper parts of the oral cavity that are involved in that swallowing mechanism. If you remember back from A&P, um, there's about 22 different groups of muscles involved in swallowing, and these are all the various cranial nerves involved with innervating those particular muscles. Um, achalasia results from the failure of the lower esophageal sphincter 
to relax owing to loss of innervation may cause food to accumulate in the lower esophagus and this also increases the risk of esophageal carcinoma and an individual with long-term achalasia. And these are some of the different things that cause dysphagia. So there's your fibrosis in A, showing you that because of the fibrous uh, connective tissue not being able to expand, it tends to contract, so it narrows that opening there. Uh, compression from a tumor on the outside also is going to make that opening a lot smaller. Diverticulum, you see this pouch there in C, and you can get undigested food that obstructs the esophagus by filling up that pouch where the diverticulum is. D is the congenital atresia, and there you see there's a um, gap between the two segments of the esophagus and um, has to be surgically corrected. Then you see the congenital tracheoesophageal fistula and that diversion into the trachea. And this can be very extremely serious, has to be corrected right away. Again, another uh, congenital defect. And then F, neurological damage to those various cranial nerves involved with the swallowing mechanism. And then achalasia, where you have a loss of peristalsis in the lower esophagus, and then it widens and the food tends to collect in that pouch there. Esophageal cancer primarily is a squamous cell carcinoma, most commonly found in the distal esophagus. Causes are chronic esophagitis, which is an inflammation of the esophagus, achalasia, hiatal hernia, alcohol abuse, and smoking. Hiatal hernia is where part of the stomach protrudes through the opening, the hiatus, in the diaphragm into the thoracic cavity. Now there are two types. There's a sliding hiatal hernia, which only occurs when a person is lying down. It resumes normal position upon standing. And then rolling or paraesophageal hernia, where part of the stomach protrudes above the diaphragm, forming a sac, and surrounding peritoneum persists in mediastinum. This can cause reflux, burning, dysphagia, and gas development. These are types of hernias. Your normal stomach is on the left, picture A. Picture B shows you a sliding hiatal hernia, usually positional. And then you see the paraesophageal hernia, where you have a persistent sac and peritoneum in the mediastinum. Also, this type of condition can put a lot of pressure on the left lung and cause people to feel like they have a respiratory problem because of that pressure on the left lung. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, usually accompanies a hiatal hernia. Substances that you should avoid, caffeine, fatty foods, alcohol, cigarettes, and spicy foods. Gastritis, inflammation of the stomach, and this can be acute or chronic. Acute is an inflammation of the mucosa, may be ulcerated and bleeding. Causes infection by bacteria or viruses food allergies, ingestion of spicy or hot foods, excessive alcohol intake, ingestion of aspirin, or other ulcerogenic drugs or toxins. Chronic causes peptic ulcers. Also alcohol abuse will cause it, and it could be the natural effect of aging. Gastroenteritis, inflammation of the stomach and intestines. Common causes, Staph aureus, E. coli, which um, the common cause is traveler's diarrhea, salmonella, um, rotavirus, entamoeba histolytica, which is amoebic dysentery, and clostridium botulism which hopefully you won't ever have that because that's very extremely serious and very often fatal. Um, 
which comes from poorly canned food and prepared meat. Um, don't see it too much anymore though, thank God. E. coli L157 is enterohemorrhagic E. coli. That is a highly virulent strain of E. coli and very common source of food poisoning. Um, these bacteria release toxins in the intestine which damages the mucosa and blood vessel. Very dangerous type of infection too. Now we move on to peptic ulcers usually appear as a single small round cavity in the smooth margins that penetrate, penetrate into the submucosa. Um, gastric and duodenal ulcers can erode into the stomach muscularis and cause bleeding that can be detected by the presence of anemia or occult blood in stool. The major causative agent is Helicobacter pylori, but other metabolic and biochemical imbalances can be to blame. So complications, bleeding, perforation, peritonitis, obstruction, um, common in males and those with type O blood. Symptoms, epigastric burning or aching pain, usually two to three hours after meals and at night, and acids can help with the burning and the pain. Diagnostic tests for peptic ulcers, fiber optic endoscopy or barium x-ray may be used, biopsy may be done endoscopically. Treatment, usually a combination of drugs, uh, antimicrobial drugs and meds to reduce acid secretion, uh, bismuth subsalicylate eradicates H. pylori and tagamet and prilosec reduce gastric secretions. Partial gastrectomy is surgery that may be required in patients with perforated or bleeding ulcers. Stress ulcers. They can result from severe trauma such as burns and these are called curling's ulcers or from a head injury which causes a stimulation of the vagus nerve to produce something called Cushing's ulcer and or it could be from hemorrhage or sepsis those are other causes. Gastric cancer arises primarily from the mucous glands. Gastric cancer is asymptomatic in the early stages and usually is not diagnosed until it is very well advanced and at which point the prog prognosis is very poor. It tends to run in families and also people with type A blood. Sometimes it's connected to a diet, a food preservative or nit nitrates or nitrites as smoked foods can increase the risk. When diagnosed, prognosis is poor the five-year survival rate is usually around 15 percent. And this is showing you a picture of peptic ulcers and gastric carcinoma. So what you're looking at here is you're looking at a, an esophageal ulcer in the lower part of the esophagus. There's your gastroesophageal sphincter, the fundus part of the stomach, the greater curvature, the lesser curvature, there's a gastric carcinoma in the body of the stomach, gastric ulcers in the bottom part of the stomach near the pylorus. There's more gastric carcinoma. There's your pyloric sphincter. There's duodenal ulcers in the beginning of the duodenum. And this is showing you common locations. So gastric carcinoma here, erosions happening in the mucosa due to the carcinoma, and then looking here at inflammation and then a perforated ulcer and then this picture over here is showing you an ulcer in E. These are multiple stress ulcers of the stomach. You can see those are where the dark areas are. Disorders of the liver and pancreas. Gallbladder disorders or the formation of gallstones. 
Colithiasis. Cololithiasis, sorry. Formation of gallstones. These are calculi that form in the bile. Cholecystitis, inflammation of the gallbladder or cystic duct. Cholangitis, inflammation usually related to infection of the bile duct. And cholito, colithiasis, obstruction by gallstones of the biliary tract. Just some interesting words for you to have to remember and pull your hair out over. The term cholecystotomy is the term for the removal of gallstones through incision in the abdominal wall. I just thought I'd throw that in there because that's something, it's a procedure that's quite, quite common. Now gallstones vary in size and shape and may form initially in the bile ducts, gallbladder, or cystic duct. They may consist primarily of cholesterol, in which case they're white or crystalline, or bile pigments, bilirubin, in which case they're usually black. They tend to have a lot of calcium salt precipitates as part of their makeup. Cause more common in females and high cholesterol level in biles. And bile. High risk factors, obesity, high cholesterol intake, multiparity, and use of oral contraceptives or estrogen supplements. Bile stones are more common in individuals with hemolytic anemia, alcoholic cirrhosis, or a biliary tract infection. There's your possible location of your bile stones. So you see it here and the ducts coming from the liver. There's your cystic duct blockage right here at the entrance into the gallbladder. Coming down through the common bile duct, you see them there. You also see them at the entrance to the pancreatic duct and can be quite painful. Here's your types of gallstones. Unfortunately, this is a black and white image, but it tells you there's a lot of vari variation in color and also in size and shape. Treatment of gallstones. Removal of the stones is usually what they have to do. And in many cases, stones are fragmented by shockwave lithotripsy. Icterus, that's a that's the medical term for jaundice. It's a yellowing of the skin, usually starts with the whites of the eyes, also called hyperbilirubinemia, not a disease itself, but rather a sign of many different types of primary disorders. And it's classified um, into three different groups. Prehepatic jaundice is excessive destruction of red blood cells. Uh, results from hemolytic anemia or a transfusion reaction. The liver function is normal, but it cannot handle the additional bilirubin. It also includes hemolytic disease of the newborn from an RH incompatibility. Intrahepatic jaundice occurs within the liver, uh, with liver disease rather, uh, hepatitis or cirrhosis. Post-hepatic jaundice caused by obstruction of bile flow into the gallbladder or duodenum and backup of bile into the blood. It's also seen in congenital atricia of the bile ducts, obstruction called by, caused by cholelithiasis, inflammation of the liver, or tumors. Hepatitis. A through E. There's all these different types of hepatitis depending upon the causative uh, viral infection. Hepatitis A comes by way of the oral fecal root from contaminated water or shellfish. The incubation period is two to six weeks. It usually is a self-limiting infection. Um, outbreaks may occur in daycare centers and sexual transmission has occurred in homosexual populations, but it is a self-limiting infection. Hepatitis B, 
transmission by blood and body secretions. Incubation period is around two months. Transmitted by blood and body secretions. HPV vaccine for individuals in high risk groups, health professionals, and now children. 16 weeks average length of infection. Hepatitis C, most common type of hepatitis transmitted by blood transfusions. Half of the cases enter into a chronic disease state. Um, HCV uh, infections increase the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. And this is showing the course of the hepatitis B infection. Incubation period, where it's asymptomatic, usually six to eight weeks, and you, go, you can go into a carrier state, or you can go into the acute infection, which can last four to 12 weeks. The pre icteric phase or stage is where you have malaise, fever, joint pain, and then into the icteric stage where you see jaundice present. That can go into a fulminant infection where you have severe necrosis and liver failure, which leads to death. Some people recover. Some have a chronic infection, which is a long-term, either mild or goes into cirrhosis, liver failure, may need a uh, liver transplant, and could also go into hepatic cancer. So many different outcomes for people that have hepatitis B viral infections. Hepatitis D usually requires the presence of hepatitis B to replicate and produce active infection. Hepatitis uh, D and B is more severe than hepatitis B alone. Hepatitis E, again, is another like A, oral fecal transmission, common in Asia and Africa, where it causes a fulminant hepatitis that produces a high mortality rate in pregnant females. Treatment of hepatitis. Hepatitis B and C may be treated with interferon alpha and lamivudine epivir to reduce viral replication, effective only in 30 to 40 percent of the cases, however. Otherwise, the infection results in gradual destruction of the liver, leading to cirrhosis and hepatocellular cancer. Cirrhosis presents with extensive diffuse fibrosis and loss of lobular organization. It is a progressive disorder and eventually will lead to liver failure. There is a picture of cirrhosis resulting from chronic viral hepatitis. And then we go into cirrhosis. Now there are three general causes of cirrhosis. Alcoholic liver disease, which is the largest group it's called portal or lindaic cirrhosis. Bilary cirro cirrhosis is associated with immune disorders and those causing obstruction of bile flow, um, especially with stones or cystic fibrosis where the mucus plugs form in the bile ducts. Postnegrotic cirrhosis is linked with chronic hepatitis or long-term exposure to toxins. Three stages of alcoholic liver disease. Accumulation of fat in the liver, so you usually get the presentation of a fatty liver. Alcoholic hepatitis, uh, inflammation and cell necrosis occurs, usually asymptomatic, but may manifest with mild symptoms, anorexia, nausea, or liver tenderness. End stage cirrhosis, fibrotic tissue replaces normal tissue, Little normal function remains. Impaired digestion and absorption are usually early indicators of this stage. Pathophysiologic effects of cirrhosis. These evolve from two factors. The loss of liver cell function, where you have the decreased removal and conjunction of bilirubin. Reduction in the following. You have the reduction in bile production, impaired, uh, reduced clotting factors, absorption of nutrients, and storage of vitamins and minerals. Also decreased removal of toxins. 
The second thing is, is you have interference with blood and bioflow in the liver. So the major effects are related to the obstruction of the bile ducts and blood flow. So reduced bile for fatty emulsification in the intestine. Backup of, liver, backup of bile in the liver causes jaundice. Uh, portal, dis, portal hypertension from reduced blood flow through the liver causes splenomegaly or an enlarged spleen. Uh, also esophageal varices and ascites um, develops, which is an accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal cavity. And there you can see the development of esophageal um, ascites. Now, if you remember back from AMP2, that the portal vein gets fed by these various veins that come from other organs, um, like the spleen and the esophagus and the stomach and the intestines. So when you have high pressure in the portal vein because you're having problems with flow through the liver, then that backs up. So you do have enlargement of the spleen, you can have problems with the stomach, you can have high pressure in the inferior mesenteric vein, which is coming off from the intestines. Um, and also here's where you have the esophagus and your bulging esophageal varices caused from this distension here and this blockage of blood flow. Here's liver cancer. This is hepatocellular carcinoma. So you see a very large tumor at the left and that's right here and then you see a small metastatic tumor nearby. So pretty far advanced there. And this picture is showing you um, acute pancreatitis which is an inflammation of the pancreas. And this results from um, auto-digestion of tissues, maybe acute or chronic. Um, acute pancreatitis is considered a medical emergency. Mortality rate is about 20%. And this is showing you the pathophysiology of acute pancreatitis. So you start with precipitating factors, alcohol consumption, biliary tract obstruction, cancer, also mumps virus can cause it. And that activates um, pancreatic enzymes inside the pancreatic duct. So all of these, these are proteases, and then you have amylase, which is a starch enzyme, lipase to digest fats, and they start auto-digesting pancreatic tissue, which causes severe tissue necrosis, death of the tissue, severe inflammation, and then enzymes and cell contents leak into the general circulation and can cause shock, DIC, adult respiratory distress syndrome. Um, the active enzymes, enzymes can leak into the peritoneal cavity and to con continue to destroy tissue with massive inflammation. So severe pain, hemorrhage shock, peritonitis, and hypovolemic shock can be, can be fatal. Pancreatic cancer um, is on the rise in North America. Major risk factor is cigarette smoking. The common form of the neo, of neoplasm is adenocarcinoma, which arises from the epithelial cells in the ducts. Metastasizes, uh, occur, uh, metas metastasis occurs early and no effective treatment has been developed. Um, liver failure resulting from hepatobiliary obstruction is often the cause of death. Um, they're, working, or they're working on different things um, to help to treat pancreatic cancer. A lot of new re research coming out. But, um, and some chemos are helping people to live a whole lot longer, but not something you want to um, wind up getting a diagnosis of because many, many times it's, it's quite often fatal. Lower GI tract disorders, celiac disease. This is a malabsorption syndrome that is considered to be primarily a childhood disorder, but is also seen in middle-aged adults, also called celiac sprue or gluten enteropathy. 
It's linked to genetic factors and a defect in the intestinal enzymes that prevent digestion of gluten. Now gluten is found in certain grains, wheat, rye, barley, and oats. Treatment is maintaining a gluten-free diet using corn or rice for grains. Now we have a chronic inf inflammatory bowel disease, IBD. Cause is unknown. Crohn's disease usually um, occurs most often in the small intestine. It's also called regional ileitis or regional enteritis. Um, occurs most frequently in the small intestine, like I said, and presents by skip, lesion, skip lesions. And this is where affected segments are clearly separated by areas of normal tissue. Inflammation of the mucosal layer results in the formation of ulcers, which coalesce to form uh, fissures separated by nodules. And this is where you get the cobblestone appearance that you see in people that have this disease. May lead to total obstruction in that particular area of the intestine. Adhesions between two loops of intestine may develop and the ulcers may penetrate into the intestinal wall resulting in abscesses. Fistulas is where you have a connecting passage between two structures and this could occur also. The course of the disease varies from person to person. And this is looking at Crohn's disease and showing where you have these skip lesions. Um, so with normal tissue in between. And these are changes that occur in the intestinal wall where you can get narrowings and ulcers in the mucosa. And then you can also have a fistula formed where you have an abnormal opening between two structures here. And there are some pictures showing you ulcerations. And a fistula down at the bottom. Ulcerative colitis usually begins in the rectum and progresses through the colon. Development of ulcers and tissue destruction interferes with absorption of fluid and electrolytes in the colon. Long-term ulcerative colitis increases the risk of colorectal carcinoma, which may be predicted by destruction of metaplastic and dysplasia of the mucosa. So finding changes in the cellular structure of the tissue that lines the, uh, that part of the GI tract. Ulcerative colitis frequently results in diarrhea with blood and mucus. Frequent passage of blood and mucus alone, which may cause iron deficiency anemia. Treatment of IBD, exacerbations are often precipitated by physical and emotional stressors. Anti-inflammatory meds, sulfasalicine or glucocorticoids can help. Anti-motility agents, lower pyramide and anticholinergic drugs. Nutritional supplementation may be necessary also antimicrobials, metronidazole, and ciprofloxacin required for secondary infection, and immunotherapeutic agents like azathioprine, that's a long-term type of effect, and surgical resection, usually ileostomy or colostomy. Appendicitis is an inflammation of the structure called the vermiform appendix. It usually begins with an obstruction of the appendiceal lumen by a fecal lith. And a fecal lith is something called a poop stone where you have fecal matter that precipitates inside of the appendix and then hardens there. Could be a gallstone, could be foreign material, Increased bacterial metabolism and production of toxins combined with necrosis of appendix, which will cause the eventual rupture of the organ. 
When the organ ruptures, the contents are released into the peritoneal cavity, resulting in peritonitis. And this release of very toxic uh, waste materials with bacteria may be life-threatening. Treatment is surgical removal of the appendix, cleaning up the peritoneal cavity, and administration of antimicrobial drugs. There's a normal appendix, picture A, an inflamed appendix uh, below. B, smear of drainage from a ruptured appendix. You see a lot of bacteria there. And C is liver affected by acute peritonitis resulting from a ruptured appendix. So a lot of toxins released into the peritoneal cavity. That's what causes the acute peritonitis. Okay, lower GI tract disorders, diverticular disease. And this refers to various problems related to the development of diverticula. Could be congenital or acquired. Diverticulum is a herniation or outpocketing of the mucosa through the muscul muscular layer of the colon wall, frequently in the sigmoid area of the colon, which is the last area before you get into the rectum. Diverticulosis is an asymptomatic diverticular disease. Usually multiple diverticula are present. Diverticulitis is an inflammation of the diverticula. It's a common problem in the Western world, primarily in older individuals. Consistently low residue diets, low fiber, irregular bile habits, and aging lead to chronic constipation and then to muscle hypertrophy in the colon. This leads to the development of the diverticula. And the treatment, increase bulk in the diet, more fiber, and encourage regular BMs without constipation. Colorectal cancer. In the US, this cancer ranks high as a lethal cancer in individuals older than 50 years of age. Emphasis is on routine rectal exams, colonoscopy, and fecal tests for occult blood to assist in early detection and treatment. And what I've been told if you're predisposed to colon cancer due to a family member having it, or you're 50 to 55 years of age, you should have a colonoscopy and not rely on tests like a cold blood or cologuard because as with most other cancers, when you're starting to see blood present, those polyps have ulcerated and there's something that could be taken care of a lot earlier by colonoscopy detection and removal of the affected polyps. Not all polyps are, are cancerous or malignant, but they can be treated a lot earlier than letting them go into the stage where they're bleeding. Okay. Development of malignant adenomatous polyps causes the disease. Most release this carcino embryonic antigen into the blood aiding for the detection, very easily detected in a blood test. In re recent years, an increasing number of tumors have been found in the right colon using barium enema or CT scan. All types of carcinomas invade the wall, the mesentery, and the lymph nodes and metastasize to the liver. So it's something you really do not want to um, wait around to have checked. Treatment, surgical removal of the involved area, usually requiring a col colostomy. Early diagnosis is essential. This picture is looking at um, a stricture in the colon and dilated, dilated colon proximal to the stricture, stricture. Then showing you a lot of polyps and um, a large polyp with atypical cells. These pictures aren't the greatest. If you want a better illustration, I'd go on to, uh, I'd Google it and get some color pictures. And uh, maybe in time I'll put some in here, but these are the ones I have available. Um, let's move on to intestinal obstruction. And intestinal obstruction refers to lack of movement 
in the intestinal contents through the intestines and there's usually two forms of, a, of a intestinal obstruction. Mechanical obstructions, those resulting from tumors, adhesions, hernias, or other tangible obstructions. Or functional or adynamic obstructions resulting from neurological impairments such as spinal cord injury or lack of propulsion into the intestine and are often referred to as paralytic ileus. Sequence of events from mechanical obstruction. Gases and fluids accumulate in the area proximal to the blockage. Two, increasing strong contractions of the proximal intestine occur in an effort to move the contents forward. Three, intestinal wall becomes adenomatous. Four, intestinal distension leads to persistent vomiting. Five, if the obstruction is not removed, the intestinal wall becomes ischemic and necrotic as the arterial blood supply to the tissue is reduced by the pressure. If the twisting of the intestine, called a volvulus, has occurred, or if immediate compression of arteries by intussusception or strangulated hernia results from the primary cause of the obstruction, the intestinal wall becomes rapidly necrotic and gangrenous. Ischemia and necrosis of intestinal wall lead to decreased innervation and cessation of peristalsis. And this can cause a reduction of bowel sounds, which would indicate this change has occurred. Increased permeability of intestinal wall from necrosis. And you can have intestinal bacteria or toxins can leak into the peritoneal cavity, resulting in peritonitis bacteremia, and septicemia. In time, perforation of the necrotic segment may occur, leading to generalized peritonitis. So this is looking at different problems associated with um, intestinal obstructions. Here is an inguinal hernia that's caused an obstruction. There's a volvulus, which was, remember we said strangulated intestine. Um, or a blockage there caused by a twisting. And then here's where you have an intussusception and where you have a piece of intestine actually go back up inside another piece. A tumor can cause a blockage. And then also here you have diverticulitis, diverticulum filled with feces and restricts the opening there. And there's a picture of a hernia. Effects of mechanical obstruction. There's the site of the obstruction and you get a backup of fluid and gas that lead to distension in the preceding segment and that distension causes increased uh, peristalsis to force contents past the obstruction leading to colicky pain. Um, and then because you have this backup, severe vomiting from the distension and pain leads to dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. Increased pressure on the wall causes more fluid to enter into the intestine and decreased blood pressure and hypovolemic shock as third spacing of fluid shift occurs into the intestine continues. So you're losing fluid from the blood and that continued pressure on the intestinal wall causes edema and ischemia of wall and decreased peristalsis and over time this diminished blood flow causes increased permeability and necrosis of the wall. Intestinal bacteria and toxins leak into the blood and peritoneal cavity resulting in peritonitis. Very, not a very nice thing. So, functional obstruction. Paralytic ileus. It's common after abdominal surgery when anesthetics along with infla inflammation interfere with conduction of nerve impulses. So if you're taking pain medications, it can slow down movement through the GI tract. Also spinal cord injuries, inflammation related to severe ischemia, reduced blood flow, uh, scar tissue, and many other causes uh, due to surgery, aging, other things that could result in the problem. Signs and symptoms of obstruction of the small intestine. 
Borborygmi, nice word. It means audible rumbling sounds caused by movement of gas in the intestine. This indicates a mechanical obstruction. With functional obstruction, however, because the tract's not moving, the sounds are absent. Treatment, surgery, antimicrobial therapy are required as soon as possible for any strangulation that has happened. Functional may require decompression by suction. Peritonitis is an inflammation of the peritoneal membranes that may result from chemical irritation or directly from bacterial invasion of the sterile peritoneal cavity. Peritonitis is a secondary infection due to pancreatitis, ruptured bladder, intestinal, intestinal perforated ulcer, and perforated gallbladder. Two, bacterial peritonitis is a direct trauma affecting intestines, a ruptured appendix, or intestinal obstruction. Also from abdominal surgery where infection develops, and also pelvic inflammatory disease in females. Surgery is often required to correct the cause and to drain the site of infection. Nasogastric suction relieves abdominal distension.